In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How are you? Good. It's, it's good to be with you. Isn't it great to be Catholic? Yes. It's the greatest thing in the world. Amen? Yes. I remember the story I tell sometimes in traveling about uh, Mrs. Kennedy, uh, our former Catholic president's mother, how she was interviewed on national television uh, many years ago, of course, and the interviewer asked her, uh, Mrs. Kennedy, what is the greatest gift that you can give to your children? And I'm almost certain as I watched the interview that he was thinking because she was, her husband was a multi-multi-millionaire, her husband was a bit of a rascal, you know, but she was a holy woman. I think she had like 11 children and attended daily mass, the mother of the president. And I bet that he thought she was going to answer him, well, the best thing you can give to your children is a, is a brand new mansion the day they're married, or maybe a Rolls Royce or a yacht in the backyard there on the water, or maybe an Ivy League education, you see? But Mrs. Kennedy, she didn't skip a beat. And she told this, this interviewer on national television, the greatest gift you can give to your children is the gift of the Holy Roman Catholic faith. Amen? Amen. Is that amazing? Uh, she's probably in heaven now. I, I want to give her an applause to Mrs. Kennedy for what she said. Now, I wonder, guys, would I scare you if I go out there and preach from the middle? Is that okay? All right. I'm allowed to do that. If there's any kids in the congregation, and I see a lot of kids here today, a few big kids as well. Testing, alleluia. Well, my dad used to say to me, I don't know why I need a microphone. My daddy said I had a big mouth when I was a boy. He said, and he was, I think he was prophesying my priestly vocation when he said that. So if your sons have big mouths, just give praise to God. They're probably going to be priests. Amen? Amen. Well, beloved, we're, we certainly are living in a unique time, aren't we? Kind of unique. I guess you could say it's kind of difficult as well, a difficult time. But perhaps, beloved, this is what's needed, you see. Anything that happens, happens only because God permits it or God causes it, you see. So he's permitted this difficult time that you and I are living in. And I believe that the church has been, like, way too comfortable. Um, too comfortable. I remember I travel all around every place and some of the, even some of the monasteries I stay in, like, oh my gosh, it's like a big old TV set and a sound system, you know, and every possible amenity is there that sometimes even our clergy and our monks are living kind of um, highfalutin. And so it may be that God has to humble us now. Amen? Amen? We have to become small and humble. I don't know what's happening here in Pennsylvania, but in Georgia, after, you know, the lockdown, the, the shutdown with the COVID, and we couldn't go to Mass. They've reopened now, and most of the parishes have their full schedule of Masses now every Sunday. But they're only getting like one-fourth or one-fifth of the normal attendance. Like, church is open, the Mass is available, the body and blood of Christ are there, and still we're getting a small number of people for Masses. Is that happening here in Pennsylvania too? Isn't that sad? But it sort of shows you why the test was needed, you see? Now God is separating the shaft from the wheat. He's separating the wheat from the shaft. In other words, those who are real, they will keep going. Those who come to Mass because they love God. Not because it's a routine, you see, or I go to Mass so I can get like a, a plus point from God on my report card. But those who go to Mass because they're hungry for God. Because maybe they're starving for the Holy Spirit. Maybe they need God inside of them. And they know that He is the only way, the only truth, the only life, the only salvation. Amen? Amen. Only Jesus. Amen? Amen? And the great thing about being Catholic is we have Jesus not in name only. We have Jesus on the holy altar, physically present at every Mass. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. 
I remember a couple masses, I don't have time now to go into all the details, but do you know that two of my masses around the country, that the host, on the host, appeared a drop of blood. During the mass, wasn't it before? A drop of blood, on the, twice has happened. And I remember one time I was in Texas, and I was preaching about John chapter 6, about the Eucharist. When that happened, it was incredible. And so I share that with you to know that at every Mass, whether you and I see that red drop of blood, maybe we'll see one tonight, I don't know. God's the boss, I'm not the boss. He'll decide those things. But no matter what we see with our eyes, God is present on the altar. Amen? I remember, beloved, when I was in the seminary, there was a story of another young man who was in the seminary and had just been ordained. And this particular priest, um, he had been a Methodist. He'd been a Methodist seminarian. And he was in his seminary, I believe it was in North Carolina, where his seminary was. And the professor in the Protestant seminary was teaching them, rightfully, from the Gospel of St. John, and guess what chapter of St. John he was teaching from? John chapter 6. And so the professor in the Protestant seminary is reading out from John's gospel that, about I am the bread of life, and the man who eats my body and drinks my blood will live forever. And the professor is reading the passage and trying to, to talk about it and explain it. And the seminarian in the back, he's raising his hand because he has to, has to ask a question. But the professor ignores him and keeps going and talks about how if you, if you don't have my flesh within you, you have no life within you. Only the one who eats my flesh only will live forever. And finally, uh, Wilbur, he, he was just like bursting. Oh, oh professor. Oh. And the professor finally looked at him and said, Wilbur, yes, what do you need? And he said to the professor, Why? Have I never heard this before? In any homily, in any church, how have I never heard this passage before? He was upset. Why have we never talked about this? We've never taught it. We never preach about it. Why, he said. And the professor didn't have an answer. And Wilbur, true story, he was so upset, he took his books and ran out of the classroom halfway through the, through the class. And you know what he did? He kept on going. And you know where he ended up? He ran to the local Catholic church about two blocks away. True story. And the Methodist seminarian banged on the door when he got there. He banged and banged and banged and finally, Father opened the door. And Father said, yes, how can I help you? And he said, Father, I need to know about John chapter 6. He knew that the Catholics knew something that his professor didn't know. Amen? He knew that much. And Father let him in and sat him down and explained to him what we believe. We don't just believe it. We know it! We don't just believe it. We know it. Amen? And you want that kind of Catholic faith. Your Catholic faith is not an opinion. No, the New York Times is an opinion. And usually a wrong opinion. That's opinion. Your Catholic faith is a fact. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Would you say, say this at me? Say, the Catholic faith is a fact. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. It's a fact. Amen. It's not an opinion, and it's not gossip. It's absolutely true. Amen? Amen. And one day soon, through this beautiful mother, the whole world will be Roman Catholic. Amen? Amen. Oh, yes, the whole world will be Catholic one day. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Many, many saints have said this. And one reason why is that the Father will not allow his Son, Jesus Christ, to be disrespected and ignored anymore. It's come to its limit, you see. Even in the Holy Catholic Church, where maybe three quarters of us have stopped going to Mass. I don't have to go. I think I'll stay home. 
God is going to purify the church, the country, and the whole world. And it started, hasn't it? It started. Well, beloved, don't let that catch you. You want to begin today to fall in love with Jesus, to fall in love with God. Amen? Amen. And so Mr. Wilbur asked Father, when Father God finished explaining to him about this amazing gift of the Eucharist, how we truly and actually believe and know that Jesus, the God-man, is on the altar at every Mass. And Father, I mean, Mr. Wilbur said, Father, uh, I need to have it. I need to have it. I need to have it, please. Can you give me it? He said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You got to take lessons. You got to take a few lessons first. And then if you're still with us, we're going to bring you into the Catholic Church and give you your sacraments. And that's what Wilbur did. And today he's Father Wilbur. Amen. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. But beloved, this country, this country belongs to God. This country belongs to the Virgin Mary. Amen. Amen. This is her country. So guess where I was before Mass? Uh, less than two hours ago. Anybody have a guess? Close? I was someplace where General George Washington prayed. Valley Forge, your backyard. Now, you all know the story, right, about the apparitions that he received of the Virgin Mary. Have you heard about that? They do, they do everything they can. Our, our media is so broken. Our media is so corrupt. But did you know first that General George Washington, President George Washington, on his deathbed, asked for his helpers to bring him a Catholic priest? Did you know that? It's well certified, and a priest was brought across the river in a canoe at the President's request. They were brought into his chambers, and they closed the door, just the President and the Catholic priest. My understanding was it was for two hours. And when... Our president, our first president was finished. And when father was finished, he left and it took him back across the river in the canoe. And we have the testimony of several Jesuit priests. When he went back to his house, they looked at him because they knew where he was. And he said to them, brothers, it's all done. It's all been done. And he went into his quarters. What does that mean? What do you mean it's all been done? He gave him a bowl of Cheerios? What does he mean by that to his brothers? And they all nodded their head. Because we know what it means when a priest goes into the room of a dying man. We know what it means. If he's already baptized, you anoint him. If he's not, you baptize your president and you give him all the sacraments. Amen? Amen. Did you know that your first president died a Roman Catholic? Yes. So you never hear about it, do you? There's a lot of evidence for this, by the way. The first time I saw it, I was just a... A little guy, and I saw it on EWTN with Mother Angelica, with two historians explaining it to her way back then. But to me, something is so stunning is before he was president, when he was the general of our army, he was there in Valley Forge, and we went right to the place where his tent was. There's a marker there. They tell me it's like the only marker there that's really not advertised. Everything else is like advertised and pretty and big. This is like kind of dull and to the side. No one really goes there. It's the tent where he had, he was set up there right during the, the war when they were starting to lose. It was freezing in Valley Forge and he was in a tent there studying and praying to God. And you know, the testimony is, is rather certain. They found an article dated 1820 in the Library of Congress, an article written by one of the officers who was General Washington's assistant, telling what he saw when the general came out of his tent where we were today, with his face looking different like a glow of heaven on his face. One of the officers explains this, that the general told him, while I was in there, he said, I was first upset at you all, he told them, because he had given strict orders that no one was to enter his tent. 
That afternoon, he was to be kept quiet so he could work on battle plans and pray. And while he was there, a light came into his tent, and he looked up startled, and the light got bigger, and he said that a woman of absolutely heavenly beauty stood out of the light and looked at him. He had never seen such a person as before in his life. This is what Jenna Washington said to the assistant officer. And he started to tell this beautiful woman, what are you doing in my tent? You have to go. As he got ready to chastise the mother of God, he couldn't move his arms. His lips wouldn't work. He was frozen. Almost like somebody prayed the unity prayer against him right then. He was paralyzed and he couldn't move. Well, beloved, that holy woman began to speak to him. And she called him son of the republic. She called him son of the republic. And she said to him, son of the republic, she stretched out her hand. She said, look, she said, and learn. And in front of our general, he saw first clouds that disappeared. And he saw the revolutionary war that he was fighting right then. It was horrendous. It was about to get worse. But Our Lady showed him that ultimately that he would win, though he was totally outnumbered that he would win, the country would be established and would flourish for many, many years. Amen? Amen? And the vision disappeared, but Mary did not. And a second time she said to our general, she said, son of the republic, and she moved out her hand. You see, just like she is there, she moved out her hand to our general in Valley Forge. She went like this. She said, look, she said, and learn. And a second vision unfolded in front of him. There were clouds at first, and when the clouds dissipated, he saw another war in our country, American against American. And he saw also blacks versus whites, some fighting for, some fighting against. He saw a civil bloody war. It was horrendous what Our Lady, especially the bloodshed that he saw. But Our Lady showed him that there would be enough godly people in this country that would pray. And when they prayed, the victory would come from heaven, the war would end, and the country would be reestablished and flourish again, maybe for another hundred years. Amen? Amen. She showed him that too. As if that wasn't enough. Then Our Lady, she looked at our general, and she put her hand out again. She said, Son of the Republic, look, she said, and learn. She stretched out her hand. More clouds came when they dissipated. He saw a third war in our country. Towards the end of time, he was told. The worst war, she said, in the history of the United States of America would occur. And she told him the whole world will be aligned against this country. The whole world will be aligned against us. She said much more. We'll be under attack from all over the world. Then she showed him something. He saw pockets of faithful Christians across the United States of America, pockets of communities with their hands raised, praying, pockets across the country. And as they prayed fearlessly, God heard them from heaven. And he sent down a, an army of angels into this country. And they got rid of all the evildoers. And the battle was won. The country was saved and we were converted after that. The third and greatest battle. I think it's now. You know, even the money that's coming in, like, to pay the rioters, you know, the different groups to pay them, is coming from a multi-billionaire in another country. Right? Things are, we're being manipulated from other countries right now. But here's the thing. We always win. And we will win through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the Queen of Valley Forge. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to win this battle. We're going to win.
Beloved, we're going to win. That's Mary's middle name, Victoria. And her son's middle name is Victor. And if you're baptized, your middle name is Victor or Victoria. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so our God, beloved, he's the God of hope. He's not the God of sadness or depression. That's Lucifer. That's the devil. I've seen him many times as an exorcist, both in people and actually apart from them coming at me to attack me. I want to tell you something. That boy is kind of ugly. The devil's kind of ugly. And I never see him smiling. He's the biggest grouch in all of Pennsylvania. He's the biggest grouch in the world. Amen? And so if you have a Catholicism that's depressing or grouchy, boy, you better go to confession. I think you're still in confessions right now. Because you're not following Jesus. Our God is the God of victory. His mother is the mother of hope. We always win. Amen? So we're going to do the Roman Catholic cheer, the Virgin's cheer right now. Are you ready? This is General George Washington's cheer. Amen? He won definitively on his deathbed when he became Catholic. Amen? Now this is our cheer too. Would you say this after me? If you want to, you can raise your right hand like a victor and say, We always win. We always win. We always win. Now make it louder. Put both hands up and do it louder. Say, We always win. We always win. We always win. And we will always win. Joseph. Don't leave him out. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, beloved, did you realize that victory is stamped on every host that's consecrated? When the priest does the consecration during Mass and says the words of consecration, the victory of heaven comes and indwells that little host. And when we give you the body of Christ today, you are receiving victory from heaven. Amen? Amen? That victory is written on and in the host. And today when we give you the body of Christ, you receive the victory of heaven. Amen? Amen. And so we've got to be ready for that. I want to ask you to say a Hail Mary with me right now, that this will be a beautiful Holy Communion, perhaps the best one of your life. To receive the Lord well, we need the Virgin. One Hail Mary now. We can receive Jesus in communion today with faith, not with an opinion, with absolute faith of fact. It's the God-man, and it's his victory that we're receiving today. Are you ready? Let's pray for that gift. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. We love you, Jesus and Mary. Amen. Aren't we blessed? We always win. Amen. And beloved, I want to go on and on, but I, I won't go on too much longer now. But here is the word from the Holy Spirit for us tonight in a special way. He gave it to me for you before the Mass. And his mother's reminding me again now. The word is this. This is decision time. That's what this is. This is decision time. For every layman, for every nun, religious really sister, for every priest, this is decision time. Amen? Amen? And beloved, we are going to say yes to God. I'm going to claim everyone here. I'm going to claim all of you to become saints. Is that all right? Is there an intention for today's Mass? I didn't see one. Is there an intention for the Mass today? Do you know what the intention is? Okay, I'm going to add a second intention. I think I have maybe the authority to do that. Is that okay? Is that all right, God? Oh, he said yes. Okay. 
don't know what the intention is. Ooh, but I'm getting the anointing. You know what I mean? The goosebumps all over me. Because I have an intention for this Mass. If you will allow me to do this, I want to offer this Mass that everyone in this church becomes a saint. No, not a half saint. No, not a wimpy saint. There's no such thing. Everyone here becomes a saint one day. Amen? Amen. You know why? Because sinners are miserable. Only saints are happy. Amen? Amen? So I might as well say to you, I'm off of this Mass, that you will be delirious with joy the rest of your life. Amen? Amen. I don't know the other institution, but that's my institution for this Mass. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah! It's time to be done, but I'll tell you this as I finish. One of my best friends, Padre Pio, he said, this is the weapon. Beloved, if this is the food of heaven, this is the weapon of heaven. If this is the food of victory, this is the weapon of victory. Amen? Amen. Don't let anybody fool you. John Paul the Great, with three doctorate degrees, said this was his favorite prayer. This is a prayer for saints and scholars. It's a prayer for children and teenagers as well. Amen? Amen? Always keep this in your hand because those who pray this rosary will never, ever, ever, ever be lost. Ever. Those who pray the rosary will go to heaven. Amen? Amen. Alleluia. Oh, baby, I got to stop right here. I'm getting too excited. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I love you, Jesus. I love you. And I love your mother. Amen. Thank you for saving my friends. Let all of them go to heaven. Let all of them go. And may they all become saints. Amen.